Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. Back in the Gospel of John today. We begin chapter 8. Now, I debated on whether to deal with this or just ignore it, and I thought as it's printed in almost all of our Bibles, I should address it. I want to address a textual note. In the ESV, it's put between chapters 7 and 8. And uh, any version later than the King James has something like this. It says, uh, in my Bible, the earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 7, verse 53, through chapter 8, verse 11. Now, in case you don't know what a manuscript is, it's something handwritten. Manu, hand, script, written. So what the text is, or what the note is saying, is that the earliest handwritten copies of the Greek New Testament that have survived, most of them have not, as you can imagine, Bibles wear out, especially in days when they were much more rare than they are now. The oldest handwritten copies don't have any verses. Up until about 600 years ago, when movable type printing was invented, everything had to be handwritten. Every copy of the scriptures had to be copied out by hand. From the time of Moses, God's people have been diligent in doing just that and doing it well. God is a God who speaks. He is a communicator. We know God because he communicates with people. As Francis Schaeffer said, he is there and he is not silent. He spoke to Adam. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Moses from the burning bush. <laughs> that was a surprise. One day God told Moses, write it down in a book. And God's people have been people of the book ever since. Joshua was told to meditate on the word of God every day, every night. Israel was told to have the word of God read to them every seven years. Every seven years, get everybody together, we're going to read it through. When the Bible scholar Ezra came to the promised land from Babylon to teach the remnant of Israel who came back to the land, they assembled all the people and they read the scriptures. They started early in the morning and they read till noon every day until they had read the whole thing through. And they had a Bible to read, which in that time was a collection of scrolls. Because God is a communicator and he moved his people to preserve and pass on that written communication. Paul reminded Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 16, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And you know, we talked about Ezra coming from Babylon to the Promised Land to teach people the Word, to first of all to read it through to them. It was not long, in history terms, after Ezra taught them the scriptures that the promise of those holy writings were fulfilled. And God gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And John the apostle was an eyewitness of God sending his son. And he wrote the experience down so that we would know that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing we might have life in his name. He wrote it down because he was moved by the Holy Spirit to do so. Because all scripture is breathed out by God. And is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And Christians in the early church who received John's gospel made copies of it. And they sent it on to other churches who did the same thing. And because they diligently copied John's gospel and passed it on to others, we hold that gospel, that breathed out word of God in our hands. Which leads us to the textual note before us. The earliest manuscripts do not include chapter 7, verse 53, to chapter 8, verse 11. 
Now, as you can imagine, if you hand a copy out a long document, have you ever done that? Just written it out by hand, trying to copy the whole thing? There are going to be some unintentional variations. A word left out, or a word added, or maybe a sentence. And that's how it is with the manuscripts of the New Testament. There are variations between the handwritten copies. Not many, most of them insignificant. None of the variations changes any truth taught in scriptures. Well, one rather large variation is here. And the Bible editors felt compelled to let us know. We have the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek, chapter 7, verse 53, through chapter 8, 11, is not there. So, when I read John 8, I see this note. Do I have any doubt about this passage? Do I look at that and say, I don't know if this really happened? No, I really don't. Because I believe the hand of God was on the man he moved to write the original copies of the scriptures, like John. And his hand has been on his church to preserve the scriptures, even over all those manuscripts with all their variations. Because as Jesus told the Jews in John 10, 35, we'll get there soon. Well, in a while. <laughs> the scripture cannot be broken. It is inspired, infallible, and authoritative. And with all due respect to the editors that printed and published my copy of the Bible, this note here does not tell the whole story of this passage. So, when I see something like that, I, I want some scholarly information from a well-studied person who loves the Lord and is highly respected. So, my go-to guy for scholarly information in the Gospel is Dr. William Hendrickson, who used to teach in Grand Rapids a generation, or maybe it's two generations ago now, but... And he gives a, a very good explanation, and I'm, I thought about just reading it to you, but I, I'm going to just distill it down to short sentences. What does he say about this passage? Well, first, he points out it absolutely fits right here where it is. If you stop at chapter 7, verse 52, and you jumped to chapter 8, verse 12, that it just completely interrupts the flow. That's very awkward. Second, he points out that our Lord, as he's pictured here, is absolutely in character. It fits not just the rest of what John wrote, but all four of the Gospels. He is the same as he is. Scribes and Pharisees, too. And if this were, as some would suggest, made up by somebody else and just inserted here, there would be differences, but there's not. Third, he points out the testimony of the early church fathers. Now, I'm not talking about guys like Ricky who just had a baby in his family. The church fathers is a term that scholars use to describe the pastors of the churches in the early centuries after the apostles. And many of their sermons and writings had been preserved. In fact, for several hundred dollars, you can buy a whole set of what the church fathers wrote that has been passed down to us. Years ago, I thought, oh, I wonder if I just spend the money. I think it was about $400 back about 30 years ago. But I hate to think what it costs now. I didn't. But an early church father named Papias. See, how early was he? Well, he was a disciple of the Apostle John. And you can read it in the early church father's collection. He preached an exposition on this story. So right back to the time of the Apostle John, this story existed and was being preached on. And Augustine, another church father, you know, he, Augustine's quite famous, so a lot of people quote Augustine. So he's, he's said a lot of great things. Some of them weren't so great, but he was a great guy. But he makes the statement that some church leaders removed this story from their Gospels. Why did they do took something out of the Bible. Yes, they did, he said. Because they were afraid that it would give readers an excuse to sin. 
if they read about an adulteress being forgiven, we can't have that in the Bible, so they took it out. So, to distill down Dr. Hendrickson's scholarly conclusion, basically he said, preach it. It's true. So that's what we're going to do. Let's look to the inspired, written word of God. At the end of chapter 7, Jesus, who had, you remember, been mostly ministering in Galilee because things were getting hot in Jerusalem. The Jews were planning to kill him. But we saw that in chapter 7, he came to Jerusalem for the Feast of Booths. And he came unexpectedly, remember, in kind of the middle of the week, and they were not prepared for him. They could not arrest him. During the feast, he said things that, well, that it confused the people and further angered the leaders, and they sent temple guard officers to arrest him. But they couldn't do it. Jesus' words arrested them. And when the officers get back, the council who sent them, well, where is he? like this man, he's idiots. And Nicodemus, remember Nicodemus from chapter 3 that came to see Jesus by night? He was a respected member of the council. He speaks up and he says, well, shouldn't, shouldn't we give Jesus a fair hearing? You know, the Jews were big on that. Everybody gets a fair hearing. That they're, as a society, they're very different than the Gentiles that way. Unless, of course, you were interfering with the power of the big wings and then things can slide. So they ridiculed Nicodemus. You from Galilee too? What's the matter with you? You one of those despised no account Galileans? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. I think Nicodemus did search. I think he already knew probably that Jonah was from Galilee and Elijah and Nahum. I think he's been searching. And he was coming to the conclusion that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. And very soon, he will step out of the shadows and take his stand for Jesus, whatever the consequences. Well, the meeting broke up in division, with most of them determined that they were going to put a stop to Jesus of Nazareth. So, the last verse of chapter 7, they went each to his own house, and going on into chapter 8, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him. They, they kept on coming in a steady stream, is how Dr. Weiss renders it. And he sat down and he taught them. They could not get enough of him. The, the Feast of Booths is over, and a lot of people are going home, but there are many pilgrims still in the city, and Jesus has compassion on them, and he stays to teach them. So the leaders know just where he is, but they can't take action because many of the people think, well, he's the, just the greatest, and the leaders cannot afford to have a riot take place. But if they can just catch him doing or saying something that people think is wrong, problem solved, call out the guard, arrest him, or better yet, Get the people so angry that they pick up stones and kill Jesus themselves. That would be the best of all. In fact, when we get to the end of the chapter, that's exactly what happens. Now, it doesn't work. Because, did you know that you can never do anything to change the plan of God? You knew that. You're good Bible scholars. John often observes Jesus' hour had not come. The plan of God was that he die at the Passover. That's going to take place in about six months from this time. At the Passover, when all the Passover lambs are sacrificed, because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So it's not the hour, but it's building up to that point. The whole history of the world is building up to it. Peter later will tell the Jewish leaders in Acts chapter 2, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. God planned it to save sinners. They planned it to hold on to their wealth and their power. 
Guess who wins? So here's what they do. Jesus is sitting in the temple, teaching the people truth that will set them free if they'll only believe. And suddenly, verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. Placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman had been caught in the act of adultery. This is a trap. The point is not, let's deal with adultery. The point is, let's deal with Jesus. And they were absolutely brutal in the way they did it. They revealed their hearts. They put her in the very center of the temple court. And they said, teacher, this woman had been caught in adultery in the very act. That's the way the New America Standard renders it. Do people in court ever stretch the truth? You know anything about our court system? It seems like that's all they ever do. If she was caught in the very act, where's the guy? You, you did know that it takes two, right? Verse 5. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. That is not what the law said. Let me read it to you. Leviticus 20, 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Where's the guy? Makes you wonder if the guy was in on the plot. Things like that happen, don't they? The depths of evil to which people will go to get what they want. And even do it with the cloak of religion to make it seem okay. It's so human. People often say, oh, that's inhuman. Well, usually, no, it's very human. <coughs> so human. But no one will get away with it. Isn't it frustrating when people get away with things? Well, one of the things you learn in reading the scriptures is that no one gets away with anything. Every single deed will be accounted for before God. Revelation 20, verse 12, John, who's writing this gospel, sees this in his vision. And I saw the dead, great and small, all of them, rich, don't get away with it. Great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what is written in the books according to what they had done. Nobody gets away with anything, including the guy. It's all in the books. If that's where the story ended, we would all be in trouble. Don't you agree? Mm -hmm. We would all be in trouble. But there is another book, which is the book of life. Jesus came that that book might exist. He came that there would be a redeemed people, a people whose sins have been paid for, the debt canceled, the justice of God satisfied, where the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every one of those people who have been joined to Jesus Christ in new life have their names written down in the book of life forever. And every one of those people are secure in him. But these Jewish leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they had no concept of that. The scribes, they, they were the experts in the law. Moses. They're all studied up in everything the law said. The Pharisees, were, they, were, they weren't necessarily educated people. A lot of them were. What they, they were kind of a club of Jews. We thought they were really good at keeping the law. I'm proud of it. To them, the law was not God's tool to show them how desperately they needed a Savior. To them, 
the law was a tool for them to use to get what they want and make themselves look good. Continuing verse 5, the law says, stone women like this, so what do you say? And John reveals the plot, verse 6, this they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Not to obey God, but to get what they want. They thought they had him. If he says, stone her, that's what the law says. What's going to happen to his followers? I mean, this, this is the man who is called the friend of perfect tax collectors and sinners. He talks about grace and forgiveness. If he says, stone her, then he's just one more empty talker. And the people will be done with him. But if he says, let her go, then he's openly breaking the law. And we can arrest him and kill him. And nobody can say boo. But just like when they sent the officers to arrest him, they were not in control of the situation. Jesus was. Jesus is always in control. And he still is. Instead of passing judgment on the woman, Jesus passed judgment on the judges. Last half of verse 6. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger in the ground. What did he write? Well, John doesn't say. Let me quote Dr. Wiersbe. He's always good to quote. We do not know what he wrote on the dirt floor of the temple court. Was he simply reminding them that the Ten Commandments had been originally written by the finger of God and that he is God? Or was he perhaps reminding them of the warning in Jeremiah 17, 13? O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. Whatever he wrote, things were not going according to plan. So they continue asking and asking. That's the tense of, of the verb. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. Now, these men, at least the scribes, had studied the law of Moses. They knew that Deuteronomy 17.7 requires the witnesses of the crime be the first ones to throw stones. Were there any there who were eyewitnesses of what happened? Don't know. But every man there was a witness of the sin of adultery taking place in his own heart. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had taken apart the shallow use of the law that they were used to. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Now, that part these guys had down. Okay. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, Cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. That is how desperately every person needs a Savior. That is the wickedness of the human heart. That is why no one, and I'm not just talking to guys here, no one has a life to offer God that earns his approval. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in spite of their lifestyle of covering it up, these guys knew it. Verse 9. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older one. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. 
don't miss the fact that that's where we all are, standing before Jesus. People can accuse us, and sometimes rightly so, but all of that's temporary. Every man, woman, and child will one day stand before the eternal judge, and the judge will be Jesus. We saw that in chapter 5. He said the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Who will sit on that great white throne when the dead, great and small, are judged by what's written in the books according to what they have done? Jesus Christ is the one sitting on that throne. So, what does he say? The one who will be sitting on that terrifying throne, what does he say to this guilty woman? Verse 10. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, now, we, we mentioned this back in chapter 2. The, the term woman is a common way of addressing ladies in that day. Today, we would say ma'am. Okay? So, not, woman, where are you? That's, that's not what they say. Ma'am, where are you? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. People can condemn and they do. But in the long run, what does that matter? What does the judge say? And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. What did we read in chapter 3? For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, there is another book that will be opened that day. Which is the book of life. There is a book of life where the names are recorded of all who place their faith in Jesus Christ and in his finished work on the cross. Now do not think for a minute that Jesus was being easy on sin. He took sin, including this woman's sin, and my sin, and your sin, so seriously that he will go to the cross and suffer the penalty for it. And he did not just pay the penalty of it. He set us free from its control. This woman whose life was ruined by sin. What, what is this lady's life going to be like from this point on in that society? Today they put it on television to enjoy it. Her life is ruined by sin. But this woman can live a new life. He did not leave her in that which will destroy her. Everyone who places their faith in Jesus Christ has a new life to live. We studied that in Romans 6 a couple years ago. So I wasn't here then. Well, my sermons are online. <laughs> Call them up. Paul says in chapter 6, verse 15, What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By the way, they, they, they rake Paul over the coals for saying that. You know, you're, you're letting people sin. This trusting Jesus as your Savior, that, that's a terrible thing to do. You need to put people under the law and make them obey God and do right and do all that. You, and they do all those things, then, then they're saved. Paul said, no. We're not under law, but under grace. So are we to sin? <laughs> By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? 
But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to that standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. That is what it is to be a Christian. See, what's a Christian? That's somebody who used to be a slave to sin. Now they're a slave to righteousness. No more, no less. Why do born again Christians, and we could go on for a whole sermon series on that. We're going to stick with the Gospel of John, but it's just, you know, obvious question. Why do born again Christians still struggle with sin? Because, as we studied in Romans, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and constantly consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Because that is what Christians are. It's a whole new mindset. But, again, that's another sermon. We're not told what the woman did here. I suspect that she followed Jesus, placing her faith in him. There's nothing like realizing your sins are freely forgiven for making God a follower of your sin. Nothing like that. In a world where there was nothing but darkness for this woman, now there is light. And that is the next sermon. Let's worship the Lord.